Welcome to another episode of Talking Stock. This week, I'm in the Melbourne suburb of Mount Waverley, visiting Unimar president and owner-operator of Dream Puppets, Richard Hart. In this episode, we talk about Richard's journey with his independent puppet business and his methods of producing his particular brand of black light puppetry. Join Richard and I now, here on Talking Sock. Richard, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, and this is a, a wonderful thing you're doing. Thank you very much. I'm going to start the, the podcast the same way I start with everyone. So my first question to you is, why puppets? Why puppets? Oh, interesting. Well, for me, it was accessibility in terms of being able to actually put a production together in a on a small scale, in a small situation. You know, being mostly a one-person performer, puppets are something that's easy, fairly easy and cheap to put together. It's not like a big production which involving casts and lots and lots of money. Puppets are also something that I find that go into another realm of reality. I went to art school, was mostly interested in painting, uh, but then I moved into other areas. But I was particularly fascinated by surrealism and just the free imagination, just coming up with whatever was in my head basically at the time and just letting that, all that flow onto, onto the canvas. Yeah. And so did that, is that what led you to blacklight puppets, that kind of uh, idea? Ev- of, eventually, uh, yeah. but, but with puppetry, it was, it, it was like, I think Peter Lyndon Wilson was the one who actually stated that puppetry, is, puppetry was the theatre of the impossible. Mm, it's a beautiful statement. Yeah, and mm. I uh, just, that really summed it up for me and that's what I really loved about puppets. Okay. Yeah. So when I f- fell in love with puppets, I could see them as theatrical objects or theatrical devices or characters that could just do the impossible. Oh, well, that's a great answer. When did you know exactly when puppetry was it for you? When did you know it was the thing that you were going to do for the rest of your life? Uh, I didn't know it was going to be for the rest of my life, <laughs> and I've still got the rest of my life to go. <laughs> I like that attitude. Yeah. That's good. Uh, I think the major kick for me was going to the uh, Tasmanian Puppet Festival in Hobart in 1979. While I was at our school, um, I was catching the lift. This was at, uh, It was then called Alexander Mackey in Sydney in the Rocks. I went to that school. Oh, right. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it, it was multi-storey. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lift to, to get from one section to the, re- to the other. And I noticed a poster in the lift and advertised the Puppet Festival in... Tasmania. Fortunately for me, my mother was actually living in Tasmania. So, uh, but I was just drawn to it. And I thought, I've got to go. I've got to see what this is all about. Because I'd actually been experimenting with puppet-like things before. Just sort of like little characters that didn't necessarily move. I actually um, did a lot of work with slide photography. Mm. This is back in the 80s. This mm-hmm. is before video really got going. Especially, uh, it was well before digital video projection. So for our listeners who are a bit more Gen Y than that, can you tell us a little bit what <laughs> slide photography means? A slide was just like it was already a a negative film. So when it was taken, it would just become a transparent image. And so how did that translate into sort of a a show of sorts? Were you putting the slides in and creating a sequence of images like a film? Yeah. To describe what I do, it's it's, it's very filmic, really. And Mm. uh, this particular case, it was a project uh, while I was at art school and uh, it ended up becoming a slide show Mm -hmm. because slide shows were actually quite big then in the mm. late 70s and because um, they were multi-screen things you know and dissolve units so they were very sophisticated very, almost like watching a movie I came up with this idea I was given a, given a, a problem the art teacher said here's a spot in the middle of the Pacific come up with something about about that I worked on this idea which was called Inside a Whale about these two scientists who build a laboratory that's <laughs> in amazing a, in a whale and then they're visited by all these kind of strange creatures that sort of talk about other parts of the world and whatever. But I used little puppet-type things as the characters. Mm. But they didn't have to move because it was all still photography. So, what were they made from? Uh, paper mache. They were made just like puppets, really. But yeah. So I had that kind of bent, I suppose you could say. You know, like uh, I was just fascinated by being able to set up a small environment where I could sort of use that, especially with a camera because you can just focus on a small part of the world and nothing else is outside of it. Mm. I was doing a lot of that sort of stuff. When I saw this poster, it sort of clicked. And I thought, right, I want to go and see what this is really all about. And um, just 
was blown away. And what was it about Hobart and the, the show, the, the festival in Tassie that you saw that kind of did that for you? Well, I think, well, I, I grew up in Hobart and left there when I was about 11. There's something about Hobart, it's got a kind of naive charm about it. You yeah. know, it's a, small, it's a smaller city, capital city in Australia, and it's just got such a beautiful setting. Mm. And it's, got, it's a very charming city. It's got some lovely old buildings and things like that. Yeah. And uh, it's got lovely old theatre called the Theatre Royal. It's just a beautiful place. So it was a magic environment anyway for, to have this puppet festival. And the range of styles was incredible. Uh, we had a Japanese company. Uh, there was a Chinese company. The Tasmanian Puppet Theatre put on a production called Mama's Little Horror Show, which, oh. which was sort of like a precursor to um, the style that was commonly used by handspan and following groups, you know, like visual theatre type stuff. And uh, and they were running workshops. Um, I did a workshop with Beverly Campbell Jackson, who at that time was quite a, a renowned puppet maker in Sydney, and then met Dennis Murphy and a few other people because Dennis Murphy was the only person there who was actually living in Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> we got back together again after that and started working together and came up with all sorts of crazy ideas and things and worked on puppetry from there. So that that was really my big introduction to puppetry. Mm. And tell us about how Dream Puppets began then. It began through a niece scheme. For about 10 years I'd been a, I'd been a sole parent, so I was raising a daughter and so that was my major preoccupation. That didn't distract me from puppetry very much because I actually used to do a lot of video. Well, I used to teach puppetry and video at the Fitzroy Community School. Wow, that's cool. As part of her upbringing. So, yeah, so I was mostly preoccupied with that. And then this scheme was introduced by the previous Labor government. This was came in just when John Howard got into office. It supported anyone with a business idea for a whole year to get the business up and running. So Dream Puppets actually started as a puppet business. The first year it was very hard to get running as with any normal business. Uh, I was very fortunate to get a gig with uh, Philip Miller ah. for a few months working on a, a film, making puppets, animatronic puppets actually, on a film called The Balanced Particle Freeway, I think it was called. It's a great name. So that was a good kicking point. So Dream Puppets actually started off as that kind of project, and it still is. It's still actually officially... Uh, a business, so I have to pay GST and that sort of stuff. And yeah, totally. And uh, how many years has Dream been running now? Dream Puppets? Well, it was founded in 1996, so it's, what, 23, 24? You're almost at your uh, quarter century, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How does that feel, to be going this long in the game? It doesn't seem to have taken that long. It's gone, <laughs> it's gone very fast. <laughs> yeah. And Okay, so I want you to reflect on that for me because I want to ask you what sort of the biggest challenge of having your own business and being a puppeteer and raising a daughter and all that kind of stuff. What has been the biggest challenge in puppetry for you? Is there a particular show or a statement piece that's really been hard to make or achieve? Uh, I think they're all hard to make. I tend not to make things easy for myself. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people could relate to that in puppetry. <laughs> I, I don't think it's necessarily because I'm deliberately trying to do that. <laughs> It's just that it seems to be what happens and it's because I get ideas and then I find a solution to it and then run with that for a while and then find a, a better solution. So I'm, I'm constantly sort of improving and constantly updating ideas and things. And a lot of it has got, actually got to do with the way the show is actually put together, the way it's presented. So uh, because of my architectural background, uh, I tend to focus a lot on the mechanics and structures of the environment. With my particular style of puppetry, that is actually really quite involved and complex. <laughs> yeah, totally. So um, I spend a lot of time doing it. So that's always a challenge to sort of get these things to work to start with. Also, what's a challenge is to actually make a living out of puppetry. And because this is, I don't have any other gig. Luckily, I've been able to do that. But at the same time, you know, you have to sort of ensure that you're getting, you're getting the gigs. So uh, we do our own marketing and that sort of stuff, but we also have other agents coming in and helping us occasionally. I'm sure a lot of our audience would really want to know how that you do that. You know, what are the nitty gritties of of, of promoting yourself and being an independent uh, full-time puppeteer? Because a lot of us have to have a survival job to be able to do what we do. How have you managed to maintain that so successfully? How, how do you get the gigs apart from doing your own marketing? Well, I think the main thing is, and what is different, some people prefer not to make a living out of puppetry because they want to be free to do their own thing. To make a living out of puppetry, you've actually got to do what other people want or like. In a way, it's a balance between being an artist and coming up with something that people, that you may not like or as much, but other people do. And how is that compromise for you? Uh, well, I, I, I avoid, try to avoid that compromise as much as possible. Sure. But 
what's important is that, um, from my perspective, uh, if you're in the business of theatre, even though I haven't had a really strong theatre background, if you're in that business, your job is to actually ensure that anyone in the audience is actually at least engaged or entertained or somehow affected in a positive way uh, with what you do. So in other words, it helps them in some way. In Australia, I, I find that the biggest audience is children for puppetry sure. to make a living out of it. And uh, that involves, you know, places like uh, kindergartens, schools, all that sort of place, those places. And uh, there is a particular demand. Uh, you need to have a certain kind of show which will work in those environments. So you You've got to cater for that. But I've been lucky in a way in that I've been able to sort of do what I want and other people like it. <laughs> so I've been very, very fortunate in that situation. Also, what I do is highly visual and that in itself, I think, it satisfies a lot of younger audiences. Totally. Excessive dialogue doesn't really interest them all that much. Oh, it's smart too because yeah. then when you, once you transcend language yeah. and you're purely about the visual, then you can pretty much take that show anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think this has been the reason why I've been fortunate in that success, uh, that you know, we have been able to go virtually anywhere. Let's talk about Blacklight then because that is the visual theatre that you create mostly, I think. Why does it draw you and, and how do you construct shows that are purely visual? How do you create narrative? Narrative normally comes from a very simple storyline. I tend to avoid words, so the storyline needs to be self-explanatory without the use of dialogue. So it's more about sort of a sequence of events that makes sense to the audience. They can see what's going on. It also demands more of the puppet, because I'm actually a real... I'm a, a puppeteer who really, really, really respects and enjoys the potential of the puppet to communicate without words just by its movements and actions. So it's through its body language, you can express emotions, the audience can feel what it's feeling. And that's that's something which fascinates audiences when a puppet comes alive on that level. Unlike a lot of other people, I prefer to, to be right in the background, almost invisible, so that the puppet has the stage completely to itself, which I find actually enhances the very thing I want to do with this visual kind of story and environment and context in which this particular character is finding itself in, so that you just go with the character. And do you find your shows are more surrealist in, in that artistic style that you, you mentioned earlier, or do you find them more linear for younger audiences? Well, there's always an element of surrealism because it is the theatre of the impossible. And, yeah. <laughs> and I just love playing with the potential that black light gives me in that things you can just appear or disappear, they can fly, they can transform, you know, like anything can happen. And you just have the first Dreamer show was pretty well surreal. It was actually mostly aimed at adults. It had success on that level because it was so surreal and bizarre, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and it's basically a character waking up and finding a staircase in front of them and going up. And then <laughs> what happens after reaching the top of the staircase is the rest of the story. So it's that kind of thing that I like. And so Blacklight really makes that possible for me. But also uh, having a really good soundtrack and that's, I'm lucky enough to have developed a long friendship with John Grant, who's the composer of all our music. Ah. Yeah, and he's a, a brilliant musician. He's now a, a member of Victorian Composers League or something like that. He just put the whole soundtracks together in his studio, which is basically a room. That's fantastic. But I want to know now, what does... What's that process look like? Do you have the show ready to show him and then he kind of goes, right, here's a piece of music. Are you rehearsing while he's in the room or does he just kind of create the music and then you just put the show together to that? What, uh, what well, is the process of that? We evolved it over the over time. Uh, the first time he showed me a few samples of music that he just happened to have and I already had a, a storyline, an idea for a show and I thought, oh, that bit of music sounds good. <laughs> yeah, and that sounds good. So, yeah. And so we started putting... So that was included as part of the show. And then what I needed to do was actually write the whole timing script and what was happening and descriptions about the characters. So it was a bit like writing um, a film uh, animation. It makes sense because your work is quite cinematic in that regard yeah. and it is animating the puppet. And so that relationship with John has progressed over the years. Yeah, yeah. How has the, the music evolved for, and how have the shows evolved with that relationship? Oh, the music got more and more um, elaborate because <laughs> <laughs> he just really loved it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an opportunity for him creatively to do something that he normally didn't get to do. So he loved what he did and he really embraced the ideas. So we just worked really well together. And the shows at the moment have endured 
as long as they have, I think because of the way the music relates to the actual visual presentation as well. They just, they're integrated so well that it's just a whole experience. Can you tell us which might be your favourite show? Probably the one I'm working on. (laughs) It's like the new, you know, like... The um, new muse. The most popular show would be Dreamer in the Deep. Okay. And then that's closely followed by Dreamer in Space. The original Dreamer is still very popular, but it's a little bit more surreal, so less... It's a bit like what I was talking about before. You know, as an artist, you want to do something and the the audience doesn't necessarily go with it on the same level. So Dreamer's a little bit like that, but I've done a lot of modification to it to sort of make it a bit more interesting to the audience because it was a bit maybe too crazy. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Can you anyway, give us a little bit of a, a, just a little synopsis of the show for people who haven't seen it? Basically, it's about a character who lives in this strange dream world. It's like a dream. They travel in this world on a bed, which has got legs. And then one time the bed gets a bit tired of this, tries to wake Dreamer out, throws Dreamer out and runs away. So the bed basically just rebels against (laughs) having to be the vehicle of Dreamer all the time. Mm -hmm. And so this character has to sort of then encounters all these obstacles or opportunities in this world to uh, somehow pursue. So, you know, it starts with a staircase and then it sort of ends up with, uh, you know, finding finding itself in a, in a fish bus that sort of travels around the universe, this universe. Love that. The dreamer finds himself in a boat uh, and then sort of has to negotiate that and sort of encounters a duck that's not particularly friendly to start with and sort of goes through all these strange, difficult obstacles ending up on a, a paradise island somewhere. And I get comparisons to Ghibli, to Studio Ghibli, and I get a bit of a comparison to Bedknobs and Broomsticks there as well. Where do you think you're inspired by in terms of creating those ideas? Oh, various sources. There was a famous cartoonist at the turn of last century who did a series of cartoons called Nemo in Dreamland. Mm. Little Nemo in Dreamland. The name of the cartoonist, oh, I've got the book over there, but I keep forgetting his name. Uh, he was actually one of the first people to do an animation in history. He did a, an animation of a brontosaurus. Ah, I've seen this. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. We will link that in the blog post, guys, so yeah. you can find it later. Anyway, so he produced this just massive volumes of, of this incredible cartoon. I mean, it was just this guy must have been on acid or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the range and scope of the imagination and creativity is just astounding. So, and that just, I just found it inspiring. I just thought, gosh. Yeah. Okay. It, there's a, there seems to be a lot of ties to animation. Do you see yourself as an animator in a lot of ways? Well, yes, I guess. But I see myself as a puppeteer in the sense that I have a, a connection with the puppet that it's almost like riding a bicycle now, you know, it's like I've been doing it for so long uh, that I just automatically put whatever I'm thinking or feeling into that puppet mm. and get it to do, get it to express whatever I think it should be expressing. Has there ever been a challenge in which you've had to change the mechanics in order to actually emote the way you need to with your puppet? Yes and no. I think <clears throat> when you're talking about challenges, a lot of it comes in with, okay, I would like, I'd like this to happen in this particular idea or story, and you don't know how to do it. We never do, really, no. when we start. So you, you think, oh, how can I make that happen? Which, you know, could I avoid having to make anything too complicated or whatever. But anyway, it came down to, in one particular case, I had to actually make, this puppet is actually quite small, I had to make a a mechanism so I could um, open and close its thumb so I could pick things up. And your mechanisms, they're pretty great. So tell us about where you learned to do mechanisms. And a lot of our listeners love mechs and they want to know, you know, how how you learn to to make mechs. How did you do it? Because you probably did it in in the time before you could learn off YouTube. Does that come from your architectural brain or does it come from the arts background? Where does the mechanisms sort of knowledge come from? I look at mechanisms and I'm baffled. Well, I think it's, uh, well, architecture and engineering have got quite a bit in common. I I couldn't work out really what I wanted to do, to be honest. I didn't know whether I wanted to be an architect or an artist or an engineer or anything, but it ended up this is why I ended up with puppetry, I think, because it had all those components. And very, very similar to myself. Yeah. 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 So um, in any case, I, I had a, a sort of a bent towards uh, devising mechanisms. Just did it a lot by myself, to be honest. It wasn't until I got the, uh, this work with Philip Miller, who who's an, I actually made an animatronic puppet without knowing anything about what I was doing, but just made it up as I went. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> For a, a pilot for a deaf children's television program and made these two puppet characters with one of them with eyes in it because being a deaf children's program one of the challenges was I had to have to make a puppet which could move its face in a way that can communicate in Auslan. Ah. 
oh no, oh no, we found something that I just need to talk to you and, <laughs> and, and see more of that. When was this show, Pilot? Uh, this was uh, early 1990s. It was actually a, a pilot. Unfortunately, uh, it never got off the ground. Well, it was shot, but it was uh, it, it didn't go anywhere because there was, a f- unfortunately, like a lot of organisations, there was a, a case of fraud, fraudulent oh. people involved and that sort of stuff. So, But anyway, uh, but I came up with this, all these mechanisms. It took me quite a long time to work them out. Philip Miller came round for dinner one night and had a look at it and just said, right, I want to give you a job. <laughs> That's great. So the, the, what, tell us about the relationship with Philip. What's it like working with someone who does animatronics and mm. how did that relationship start up and, and how has it progressed and what have you made together and tell us about that. F- Philip had quite a lot of understanding of animatronics and mechanisms and sort of stuff. Yeah, was, but he introduced me to a, a lot of ideas. He's got a vast range of resources at his disposal mm. for doing all this sort of stuff. So I learnt quite a lot from that. Uh, we worked together on a few other projects and I could have actually ended up probably for quite a long time uh, working with him. Uh, but my priority, and this goes back to the Nice program, is running a business. I basically had to focus on that. So I, I needed to actually just develop my own company. Mm. And, I, and I also wanted to do that anyway. And also being dependent on other people for a job wasn't all that viable then because it'd be periodic thought I was better off doing my own my own thing. And you certainly did. So we're going to take a break. Up next, we'll talk about Richard's role with Unimar Australia and the landscape of Australian puppets. Stay tuned. Talking Sock will be right back. This is Philip Miller. I'm Richard Bradshaw. I'm Sue Wallace. And you are listening to Talking Sock. Talking Sock Podcast. The one Orange Sock production. This is the number one podcast for puppetry in the country. Your one-stop shop for all things puppetry arts and practitioners. The number one puppetry podcast in Australia. Follow this podcast. Welcome back. You are listening to Talking Sock with Pete Davidson and today we are with Richard Hart. We've been talking to Richard about dream puppets and his process and collaboration with a number of great practitioners in composition and in puppet making. But now, Richard, it's time to talk more about you and the current work in progress. In our little break, I just went past your workshop. Something's in the works there. Tell us about that. Uh, Well, there's a few things in the works. There's a, a new show which at the moment is quite advanced, but still needs a lot more work to actually bring it together as a show and that's in boxes underneath the main desk. <laughs> <laughs> What's there at the moment is um, a remounting of an older show which is Dreamer in Space for the Nanchong and Shanghai puppet festivals uh, later this year and it's a larger version of, of this show and the theme is space and uh, space has always got to be updated because new discoveries are always made mm. and new machines are sort of, you know, new designs of rockets and that sort of stuff are always there. It's remounting it. It's, it's quite an ambitious project because it's bigger and, yeah. Would, it say, would you say it's the biggest project you've done so far? I'd say in terms of a remount, yes. The, my stage is... Um, Three three metres wide by two metres deep, so it's not like a little booth, it's actually a large booth. And so the process of going back to something that you've worked on years ago and then, and then coming back to sort of revamp it, mm. how's that been? It's been probably a regular process for me mm. because none of the shows that we do currently are anywhere near the same. They're not identical to what they were before. A lot of them have changed quite a lot. Mm. So they're always changing. And how has your practice changed over the years? Uh, I've just learnt a lot from experience. I've got better at doing some things. I've found better solutions to problems that I had before in terms of the actual mounting of the show. Do you think you're working faster? Yes, I'm, I'm making things a lot quicker. That's for sure. I'm solving problems a bit quicker, but, but I'm also creating new problems for myself, which can be slow. Because the work's more ambitious? Yeah. Yeah. And so let's talk about China because you've got quite a good relationship with China and you've been there a couple of times. And particularly as someone who's president of Unimar Australia, I want to ask you sort of how you've fostered that relationship with China. I know that you've worked on Chinese New Year this year. Well, late last year, we were offered, Australia was offered a puppet troupe to come and visit Australia for a a week or so, at no cost to us. They were going to pay the airfares, freight, accommodation, you name it. All we had to do was just organise. Um, yes, please. Yeah, organise <laughs> them, right. In a sort of a mild panic, 
<laughs> so how do we do this? I started developing uh, a relationship with the uh, Federation of Chinese Associations here in Melbourne and luckily they were very open and very interested in the whole idea. So I've been sort of maintaining a connection with them and helping them with fundraising and also uh, been working on um, ideas for to run puppet making workshops for the Mount Waverley community, which, are, which is still to go ahead. They wrote me into doing uh, these shadow puppet making workshops, which I suggested to the open public. So something that was simple to make. And is this because is this due like something to, to do with the year of the rat? Is yes, this yeah, a- yeah. Well, it was the year of the rat now. So the Chinese New Year was all about celebrating the new year of the rat. So we just made some shadow puppet rats. Adorable. How do we as Australian puppeteers create and foster those relationships with Asia Pacific? I know that there is the avenue of doing it through Unimar, but how else do you think we can do that? Well, I think that each individual can make connections with with other companies uh, in other parts of Asia. I first started connecting with Korea, actually, and that was through Unima. Mm. So uh, Unima can be a really good bridge. It's just main t- it's maintaining a constant kind of relationship, I think. You know, quite a lot of Australian puppeteers have toured throughout Asia and quite successfully too. I think that we've done really well in that area. It's just maintaining a follow-up and con- maintaining communications with those particular groups of people. What kind of shows work overseas for you, I mean, your shows don't have a lot of language in them, and I think that's really clever. Are there other parts to your shows that you sort of adapt for overseas audiences? The only kind of adaption now is because because we're performing a lot in China. It's the scale; they have big audiences. <laughs> How big? Very big. <laughs> <laughs> and for for what you do, you need an indoor space. Do you often get those kind of spaces? Well, we aim to. We are now. It, it's taken some time. It's taken a few years, actually, to sort of establish a relationship with China, It's particular, particularly um, groups in China. Now um, I've got connections with about three or four different kinds of festivals and groups. The best outcome uh, of actually doing that is that you actually get a season somewhere. Wow. You know, So we've actually got a three-week season in Guangzhou, which is a main kind of hub in southern China. Mm. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you now about your work as president for Unimar and you've been the president of Unimar Australia for nearly five years. You started in 2015. What's the experience of being president of Unimar been for you? Generally, it's been really exciting. It's it's about working with a, a group. We've had a great committee and it's also been really, really good to, to have the committee spread around Australia. Sometimes in the past, the committee's been mostly focused in one city or just a couple of cities, which has sometimes been a bit of a problem for members who don't live in those places. So by actually having the committee spread in a lot, you know, a lot of the committees actually in Perth or Fremantle, which is great because that's quite a healthy puppetry community over there. Yeah. We've got a committee member based in Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne. So it's quite a nice spread. At one point we had Adelaide as well, but not everyone wants wants to stay on the committee for forever. Mm. They've got other things to do. It's it's a commitment more than anything else. It's yeah. a focus. You've got to focus on things that can take, take you away from at times from what you want to do, but does, does Unimar have a place with Richard, Richard Hart for the next foreseeable future? Does it have a retirement home for ex-presidents? <laughs> 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 I don't think so. Look, I don't know. It's been, it'll be six years. Normally for Unimar International, uh, the longest term a president can serve is eight years. Mm. And, I mean, it depends. It's, it's often quite hard to get somebody to take these roles on. If somebody else wants to do it, fine, you know, because I think after six years, you know, and sometimes you, yeah, you may not have the same enthusiasm as, as you had at the start. Mm. Well, at the start, I mean, you know, for the first, I still think there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm at the moment, but it's not quite the same as when you're just starting off and doing something new. Regardless of whether or not you continue as president for Unimar, what is next for Richard Hart? Uh, pretty much the same, actually. We just uh, <laughs> keep going on. <laughs> I mean, I've got no plans to stop doing anything, working on a new show. Later this year, we've got three three gigs in China. We've got the Nanchong Festival, Shanghai. Shanghai is a, a really great, great festival, actually. Also, it's Nanchong. Chinese puppet festivals are, have got to be seen to be believed. Mm. A, a lot of people who haven't been there have no idea what, <laughs> what, how... Or oh, the scale of them to start with, the the presentation, everything. It's like it's like a mini Olympics, you know. It's just huge. Wow. Yeah. Uh, right. So so we've got that in a, in a season as well. So it's just keeping that up, and who knows, we might be doing more gigs in following years and 
Yeah, well, we hope so. And so who do you look up to in puppetry? A lot of people. A lot of puppeteers of my generation, I, I think, are, are great. I mean, there's so many people I could name. Well, Richard Bradshaw would be probably the most famous of all Australian puppeteers alive mm. at the moment. Yeah. But there are also a lot of other really, really good people as well and people who have younger people who are, are producing really great and amazing work and exploring and uh, trying out new ideas. I admire people who get festivals together and I think that's having put a couple together myself it's a lot of work yeah <laughs> it's quite but it's, it's it's such a giving thing to do to the puppetry community because as I said earlier what really got me interested in puppetry was going along to a festival in Hobart yeah for sure as someone who has done this for a while what advice do you have for young puppeteers and performers or builders in Australia find Somebody of like mind, that is a major help. To, you know, if you're sort of isolated, that is really hard work if you're just alone. Uh, connecting with somebody, even if it's just via the internet or whatever, with somebody else that you get on with or is interested in, in puppetry as well, and that's a good support. Well, meeting other puppeteers is really important, but also investigating training opportunities and developing skills uh, because puppetry does demand skill. Absolutely. Skill and experience, and it can take a long time to actually get really good at it. Some people have a natural ability. It's like anything. It's like sport. You know, some people are just naturally gifted at at a particular sport, and uh, with extra training, they just get really, really, really good. And I think that's the sort of thing that we should be looking at with Australian puppetry, young Australian puppeteers. If you you want to get really good at it, you've got to actually uh, get the support, get the experience and get the training and keep doing it and just be prepared to actually spend the time Mm. And don't expect, you know, to be an absolute genius in a few years. It takes quite a while. The institutions that ran courses, tertiary courses for puppetry, have shut down in the last sort of 20 years. How do you think Australian puppeteers and builders can can access that that training? Well, I don't think they can on the level that that was provided. The only real opportunity is, I mean, some have had to go overseas. That used to be the case most of the time in Australia. Now that there doesn't seem to be or very few courses run in Australia uh, with puppetry, That's probably the only other option. Otherwise, connect and maybe develop workshop training opportunities with more experienced puppeteers Mm. in your area, you know, like that can be a a big help. But, uh, you know, to actually really, really get good, you've got to um, get that experience, that that basic knowledge and and just keep developing it and developing it and um, just have to travel, unfortunately. You have to go overseas quite a lot and uh, or connect with other uh, practitioners. Do you think that our inability to get that kind of education here now in Australia has affected puppetry at all in Australia and the quality of it by comparison to other countries? Well, I'd say yes. Uh, It's just inevitable. If if you don't have that kind of opportunity, it does limit, you know, what you can learn, where you can go, go with it. What do you see for the future in the landscape of Australian puppetry, particularly in Melbourne here? What do you think everything has come to? What does it, what does it need to, to thrive? Well, I actually think it's quite healthy. Um, I think puppetry is quite healthy in, in Australia. It's diverse. I mean, like puppetry, one of the things I learnt going overseas is that Australia is not really different to any other country in terms of the actual size of the art form. Other countries have got bigger populations and so there's more of them, but proportionally they've still got the same situation as we have. We're just a very small group of people. So, um, you know, so we're a small group of people very enthusiastic about what we do. Sure are. And connecting more and more with each other, which I think is a really good thing, and seeking out learning opportunities, which is great. So I think it's a very healthy, uh, I think we've got a very healthy puppetry culture. Is there anything you would like to see happen in Australia? Well, it'd be great to have another course. Yeah. <laughs> another, tra- more training opportunities here, that's for sure. Yeah. Earlier, Richard, we were talking about, we were were sitting down having a a chocolate cake and a tea before we started the interview, and we got into a really robust discussion about uh, the arts, and in particular, the genre of puppetry, and how people who might do marionettes might have a prejudice against people who do muppetry, and and vice versa. Do you think that kind of prejudice exists among Australian puppeteers? I'd probably use the word bias, uh, because I think everyone in any art form finds the thing that sits with them. That's their that's their kind of genre, so to speak, and that's what should be the case. If if that 
suits you, if that's where you want to go and if it's just natural for you to, to go with that particular genre, then that's what everyone else does anyway and mm. I don't, you know, there's no issue or problem with it. It just might not be what other people do, that's all. And generally in, in, in our culture and especially in the arts overall, everyone's got a particular perspective on it and sometimes people can be very passionate about it and uh, decide that uh, some people can be really quite nasty about it. <laughs> Mm. Other other art forms and whatever, or you know, they just don't agree with it. They just think it's something that uh, isn't relevant, or you know, theirs is more important, or something. You know, there's all there's always a reason why people find a, a difference of opinion. As president of Unimart, and I imagine that there has to be a sense of neutrality that you have to create. But how do you promote this idea of fostering a community among puppetry that you know we don't we don't poo poo each other's forms or ideas and, and stuff like that. Well, it's not by buying into it, just not having an overall point of view favouring one over the other. I think it's just being careful to acknowledge that there are a lot of different styles of puppet theatre. Some are more popular than others. And also there's different audiences as well. One audience shouldn't be seen as being more significant or, or more sophisticated or demanding than the other. I mean, if we wanted to look at television in Australia, with children's television, for example... Yeah. There's a very low opinion in television networks about children's television. And actually, it's one of the hardest damn things to write. So, you know, it's it's really interesting that that exists. Mm. And, yeah. And children are one of the biggest audiences of puppet theatre. But given that, so there's a growing adult audience as well, which I think is really important. You know, puppetry can just cover the whole spectrum of people. So one audience is not necessarily more important than the other. It's just having that reach. I think puppetry just needs to have that reach. As president, I just see I see that overall picture that this is what needs to happen. We just have got to have that overall reach. Yeah, like very each individual artist has their own view on it, but that's their view. I'm interested. Do you have a particular target audience every time you develop a show? As with Dream, or do you think your next show will be targeted to a particular audience? Well, to survive, as I said before, as a business, you've got to actually have an audience to start with. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, naturally you have to have to tailor for an audience. Uh, but I always try to tailor not just for children, but to adults as well. So, uh, because adults are also in the room. So I tailor shows to whoever's in the room. How do you have that dual pitch? You work reflexively from who comes to the show, is that what you're saying, and you might tweak it on the spot? Yeah, yeah, the performance changes depending on the audience. And so how might you appeal to adults with, with Blacklight? I want to know about that. I think it's it's the sophistication of the actual character that they can read more than children. Children sort of, they just go with it because of a character because they just fall in love with it. Yeah. Right, and they just go with what happens. Yeah, Totally. And But also what happens has to be interesting for them and maintain their attention, which is quite challenging. And that's one of the hard things about writing or involved with children's theatre is to keep them with you. Ad- adults are also fascinated because if, if it is reasonably good puppetry, they're fascinated by that. Mm. A- adults are always engaged in, in good puppetry because they're amazed, you know, fascinated by it. It's, it's ex- extraordinary. It's like a, a leap of faith in a way, you know, like how could this be happening? You know, it's like a magic mm. trick on one level. But it's also creating a, a quality of presentation. It's the standard of presentation that adults appreciate as well. So I want to ask you about your approach to script and to synopsis, because I imagine with no dialogue or virtually no dialogue, what does a script for you look like? Is it, does it look more like a, a film score or how does it work? I suppose it's a bit like writing a silent movie, except that you don't have the, uh, the lettering put there like in a silent movie. So it's working out the, the the situations. I don't actually write all the action. The action actually develops through workshopping and constant performing. It has to fit into a time frame. That's another business thing. Like, you know, that's what the audience demands. That's what schools demand. You know, you can't have a show that goes for three hours, for example. So there's a, usually a time frame you've got to work in. And then you've got to actually work a structure of a show where uh, you sort of raise levels of intensity or whatever. It's like writing a musical score. And the musical score is actually an important part of the show as well. But it's got to actually have a kind of a structure and a purpose, an intention. And a theme, I imagine. Yeah. So, I, you know, you've said that your previous shows have to do with things like space and mm. the future, but they're very much in the imagination. Mm. So what kind of themes do you see happening in future Dream Puppet Show? Well, this new show is going to explore something to do with our relationship with the land. I think it's more about sort of just our relationship with 
our environment as such. But coming from being in a fairly typical suburban situation, but being a dreamer show, it couldn't possibly be a typical suburban situation because, Mm. um, like, it's just basically starting with a a very elaborate and um, detailed typical suburban Mount Waverley house. But what's inside the house is something else. And so it goes from there, basically, a journey from from there into this. Is Dream Puppets concerned with what's happening in the environment and Australian landscape as we we had a killer summer? Yeah, well, I am because, well, absolutely, it's been a very important thing. But at the same time, other people are dealing with the issues probably better than what I can do because the limitation of non-verbal shows is that you can't really go into a lot of detail about sort of what the problems are affecting us. But it's a bit like sort of a David Attenborough approach. You just show how beautiful the place is. Yeah, and then you lead your audience there. And then you just let them make up their own minds about But with children, I'm a bit worried about sort of making something too scary for children because I think they're already anxious about what's happening with global warming. I agree. I think, yeah, there is a generational issue with the anxiety about that. But I definitely think that our kids these days are really, really strong in the sense that they are pushing and pushing and pushing for for change. And Mm. that's really wonderful. Richard, thanks so much for talking shop with us today. We are out of time. You can find Richard at Dream Puppets, www.dreampuppets.com. Thanks for listening with us today and make sure you subscribe for more great puppetry arts and practitioner interviews. I've been Pete Davidson, that puppet guy. We'll talk sock again soon. Thanks for listening. Now we want to hear from you. Each week we'll post a series of questions related to every interview. Join the conversation on Twitter at TalkingSockCast. You can help us bring puppet power to the podcasting world by hitting subscribe, liking our socials and telling your friends. Like us on Instagram at One Orange Sock Productions and check out our episode blog at OneOrangeSock.com. You can support our podcast by pledging to us on Patreon. Your support helps fund our audio mastering, interview transcriptions, and much, much more. Find the link in the podcast notes and earn yourself a shout out on our socials. Head to our website at oneorangetalk.com or talk to us on Twitter to see how you can show your support. Our music is composed by Elizabeth Maniscalco and our cover art is by Chad Vanier. Without them, this podcast wouldn't be possible. We'll be back next week with another great episode here at Talking Sock.